And we're just going to look at this one verse for tonight. It's so paramount in our Christian life and in our Christian faith. This is what our faith is all about. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. As we read this, notice the sentence structure of this verse, because it's interesting how uh, the Apostle Paul chooses to repeat himself. And as we know, whenever there's repetition like this in the Scriptures, the repetition is there for emphasis, to make a point. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, and here he goes, he's going to flip around now and repeat, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. And just so we're all on the same page, let's define a couple things here. The works of the law are really a... Uh, the works of the law would be considered doing good deeds. It would be considered morality. It would be considered obeying the rules, being ethical, being a good-hearted person. So the works of the law, you know, for the Judaizer, it meant something a little bit more than what I just explained. I'm kind of putting it in our own context, in our own terminology in this day and age. Uh, for us, it would be morality, doing good to others, doing good deeds. For the Judaizer, it would have a, a specific link to the law, the Ten Commandments, the rest of the Jewish law that we find in the Old Testament and keeping all of that law. But basically what it means is when we talk about the works of the law, we're talking about somehow earning or deserving your salvation from God. I'm going to do something to pay God back for all the bad that I've done. I'm going to do something that's going to convince God that I'm worthy to be saved, that I'm worthy to go to heaven. And it says there very plainly, no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. You can't pay your way into heaven. There's nothing you can do to pay God back for all the wrong that you've done. There's nothing you can do to earn or deserve the love of God. He bestows it freely. And so that's what we mean when we talk about the works of the law. When we talk about being justified by faith, I put uh, on, the, uh, on the next, uh, in that box, at the very top of the box, think of justification, can sound like a very technical or complicated term, but it basically means this. When we are justified, it means that we have all of the privileges and favor of being right with God. That's what being justified is. It's... Justified means, and I, I underlined three words there in number one to kind of give the sense. Justification includes forgiveness, acceptance, and favor. Justification means, first of all, I've been forgiven of God. My sins have been forgiven. My sins no longer separate me from God. My sins are no longer on God's account. They've been, my account with God has been wiped clean. When he looks at me, he no longer sees my sin because they, it's been forgiven and removed from me as far as the east is from the west. And then secondly, this justification has the sense of acceptance. We are accepted in the beloved, Ephesians says. And that word acceptance, you know, it's, it's not talking about just... Uh, and acceptance in the sense of, well, I guess i got to put up with this, so I'll accept it. It's not talking about that. It's an acceptance where he actually is seeking us now. He's seeking us. God is pursuing us. And then thirdly, that word justification has the sense of favor. His favor now rests upon me. In fact, you know, in the Old Testament, it talks about how God rejoices over you. God is happy to see you. When God sees you coming down the street, he doesn't cross over to the other side. He doesn't hide his face hoping that you didn't see him. God is favoring you. He loves you. He accepts you. He wants to be with you. He's chasing you down. And so that's what justification includes all of that meaning. Forgiveness, what was dividing me from my God, no longer divides me. It includes acceptance, 
I am welcomed in His presence. He wants me in His presence. He comes to the garden every day, just like with Adam and Eve, and He says, Sal, where are you? And Jose, where are you? And Neil, where are you? And He's seeking you. And then He also has favor. His honor rests upon you. It, ta- it brings Him great pleasure to load you with blessings on a daily basis. And so that's what justification means. Now, it says here that we're not justified by the works of the law. So there's nothing that I can do to earn or deserve God's love. His love is a free gift, and it's a gift that must be accepted by faith in Christ Jesus. Faith. Simple faith. Just belief. That yes, God loves me because he said so. He demonstrated it with Jesus on the cross. I know he loves me. I believe it. I I accept it. And most of the time, you know, in our minds and hearts, we think that's too easy. Surely I've got to do something. Surely God has something over my head. Surely I've got to pay this back or make it worth his while in some way. None of that applies, does it? It's a free gift of God that is yours just by faith, by receiving and believing that his word is true. He goes on there and he says, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now to expound on this a little bit, I put there four or five notes, don't exactly remember, but I put there my forgiveness and my acceptance and my favor from God is based wholly upon Jesus' sacrificial work on the cross. And my acceptance by God has been wholly removed from my performance and effort. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's going to take the rest of our lives for that to really sink in. We really need to meditate on that. I really liked what you know the, the late Jerry Bridges said when he said you, we need to preach to ourselves the gospel every day. Remember when he made that statement? And we really do. You need to remind yourself every day of what the sacrifice of Jesus Christ gives you. And you need to remind yourself every day that it's free. And you'll never earn it. You'll never be good enough to deserve it. But that doesn't matter because it's free. That's how much God loves you. That's how much God, like we've said a hundred times, God did not let your sin stand in his way. He did whatever it took to remove that so that he could be reconciled with you. I put there just as an example, if my performance for the past 12 months has been sinless and perfect, anybody here like that? Anybody, uh, you know, you made it through the last 12 hours, last 12 minutes? If my performance for the past 12 months has been sinless and perfect, I still would have one and only one access to God, and that's through the shed blood and broken body of Jesus. You know, have you ever gotten on a kind of a spiritual high? You think, man, I'm really doing good, and boy, God's lucky to have me today, and surely he's going to be pleased to see me come into his throne room. It has nothing to do with you. He's pleased to have you in his throne room on your best day or on your worst day. But whether it's your good day or your bad day, you only have one way in, and it's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I cannot approach God based upon the past 12 months. You and I only have one access into into God's presence. And that's through the broken body and the blood of Jesus Christ where he took our sin upon himself and took our judgment and our punishment and he bore those sins away. Justification by faith in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the eternal foundation of relationship with God. When you've been in heaven for 10,000 years, do you realize you got there because one day Jesus on the old earth, see then it'll be the old earth, that one day Jesus on a hill called Calvary took your sin and suffered your death on the cross. That's why you get to be there for 10,000 years. We are not initially saved by faith, but then must prove our merit to God. You know, that's, a, that's kind of a thing in our minds, don't you think? You know, we, we receive 
salvation by faith so freely and so joyfully, and wow, this is great. But then after a while, we, we get into this thing of, well, I've got to pay God back, or I've got to, you know, now I've got to start earning my way. Uh, it, it doesn't work like that in God's family. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 3.3. 3. So that's, that's kind of the thought process and the attitude that, that uh, Paul was fighting against. It's, it's not a thing where now you've been a Christian for a while, so now you've got to pull your own weight. It, it, it doesn't work that way. God is the one pulling our weight. God is the one carrying us by His Holy Spirit. And there's nothing we can earn or deserve or merit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not, that's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It's a free gift. It's not for purchase. It's not for sale. It's a free giveaway by faith. It's not a result of works so that anyone can boast. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells how it happened. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. The understanding there is that he was made to be sin on the cross with my sin. When I told that lie, he carried it on the cross. When I had that lustful desire, he carried that on the cross. When I was envious and proud, he carried that on the cross. He was made to be sin with my sin so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Him. And that's an awesome thing to realize. He carried my sin as far as the east is from the west. And we know that east and west never meet, right? So that's how far his, your sin has been removed on the body of Jesus Christ. He became you on that cross with your judgment, with your sin, so that we could partake of His righteousness. And so now when Father sees you and me, He sees you, it's, it, it's as if He's looking down at His Son, Jesus Christ, when He looks down upon you. That's precious, isn't it? What in the world could you ever exchange that for? For we maintain that a man is justified by faith, what? Apart from the works of the law. I think one reason why we get so tripped up in this is because the world operates in just the opposite mode. You know, the, the world operates, if you're going to get anywhere in life, you've got to try and work hard, and, you know, everybody talks about your work ethic, and in the kingdom of God, <laughs> it, it, it's not how hard you can work or how much you can excel or promote yourself, it's how much you can receive by faith. And so, it's counterintuitive to the way most of us think, and that's why we have to meditate on it and let this really become a reality in the spiritual for us and not start operating by human wisdom. Look at Romans chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, and see, this is where it gets counterintuitive. Well, of course I'm supposed to work. I've got to do something, right? There's nothing you can add to the salvation and grace of Jesus Christ. He's provided it all. It's our job to believe and receive. To the one who does not work, I'm not trying to earn God's favor. I'm not trying to deserve salvation. I'm not trying to pay God back for all the wrong that I've done. This isn't penance. I'm simply receiving by faith, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited as what? as righteousness. It's an awesome thing. Number two, one thing we have to get settled in our mind when, when we start to get into that mode of, well, you know, I've got to do something, I've got to earn this, I've got to deserve it somehow, I've got to make things up to God. Just remember this, I can never earn and I will never deserve the salvation I receive in Jesus Christ. From this day until the day you draw your last breath, you'll never deserve it, you can never earn it. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 8, verse 3, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. There is nothing we could do to earn or merit this salvation if we could only know how wicked our flesh is and how corrupt it is. 
and how impossible it is for us to do anything good or right apart from Jesus Christ. So we need to get that really clear in our thinking. Number three, I receive God's forgiveness, acceptance, and favor freely by faith, which produces a genuine what? Remorse for my sins and desire for God. You know, there's really something, when we go and we ask forgiveness for our sins, there's got to be that godly sorrow that he talks about there in 2 Corinthians 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces what? Death. How can you go to the Savior that bled and died and was tortured on the cross for you and ask for his forgiveness without feeling remorse that it was your sin that put him there? I mean, it... When you go to the Savior that bled and died for you, asking Him for forgiveness, it's got to break your heart. There's got to be that remorse, that sorrow. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. That's the one thing. There's got to be that godly sorrow and remorse. Number four, lastly, I believe, if I continue in faith to draw near to God, no matter what sin I commit or what failure befalls me, God will never remove His forgiveness, His acceptance, or His favor from me. Nor can it be taken by any man or devil. You know, we've talked about Calvinism a little bit lately. And I think all of us really do yearn for an eternal security. Have you all thought about death lately? Have you ever thought about it's a scary thing isn't it death and judgment and what's going to happen when it's my turn to stand before the throne and sure, boy I would sure like to have a guarantee you know eternal security sounds really good when you think about death and judgment doesn't it and you know what you have that guarantee you have eternal security if you continue to draw near to God in faith no matter what happens in your life, no matter what failure or sin you experience, no matter what tragedy comes your way, I'm telling you, if you continue to go back to God, if you fall a thousand times, if you get back up and go back to God, as long as you have that heart that returns back to God, you are guaranteed salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns? Jesus is the one that died in your place. If anybody's going to gripe, he could gripe. But he's not condemning you. He's forgiving you. He's loving you. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from His love. That's why it's so important. I, you know, no matter how hard you fall, no matter how far you fall, no matter how dreadfully you fail, when you sin, get back up and run back to your Father again. That is your guarantee of being eternally secure. It's when you turn your heart away from Him. That's when you're lost. And so don't think, well, I've, just, I've blown it. I've gone too far. I've, I've sinned too great. I, He'll never forgive me now. No, that's not true. As long as you have a heart to repent and go back and cry out to Him, you will be eternally secure. Nothing will separate you. It says there in John chapter 10, verse 28, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that a great promise? My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You are eternally secure as long as you never lose the confidence and faith of returning home to your Father. He can take care of whatever mess you create better off if you don't create the mess because sometimes consequences do last a lifetime 
but you always have a home. You always have a father to go back to. Lastly, let's talk about the importance of good works for a moment. Because this is the balance of the Scriptures. We're saved by faith. We're not saved by works, right? Look at here in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Okay, so we're saved by faith, by believing in the gift of righteousness through Jesus Christ. We're not saved by doing good things or doing good works. Verse 7, so being justified by His grace. Okay, so we've got the context here, right? It's salvation by faith alone not by works. But then watch what he says in verse 8 in this very context. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, Titus, as you're speaking to your people, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in what? In good deeds. Okay, God, what is it? <laughs> you know, is it... Is it uh, is it salvation by faith, or do I now have to do good deed? What are you talking about, God? This is the balance that he brings. Why are good works important? Number one, good works bring glory to God. You see there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, I like the way this is worded. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Why are good deeds so important? Good deeds are important because it brings glory to your God. People know you ain't that good. People know you couldn't be doing those things on your own. People know someone supernatural has gotten a hold of you because they know you and they know you're not all that. And so it's got to be God in you. And so it brings glory to Him. Secondly, good works fulfill the purpose of our regeneration. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we read a little bit ago. For by grace you're saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not a result of works. You're not saved by works. Works is a free gift that is received as you believe and trust. But then look at verse 10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Created in Christ Jesus for what? I'm supposed to be doing good works. This is why I'm saved, to be doing good works. I'm to be saved, I'm to be born again, so that it's Christ living in me. If Christ is truly living in me, how can I help but do good works? Which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That's the whole purpose of regeneration. And so we can't get into the thinking of, wow, I'm free from works. I'm free from good works. I'm just saved by faith and don't have to worry about doing any good works. That's not called freedom. That's called bondage to sin. Because whenever in your life you're not doing good works, you're a slave to sin. You can't have it both ways. And so we are His workmanship. He's creating us for the purpose of good deeds. Good works validates our faith. James chapter 2, verse 14 what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? I love the way the New American Standard phrases this. I think it does a better job than the King James. He says, can that kind of faith save you? If you say you have faith, but you have no evidence of faith in the form of works, is that the kind of faith that truly saves you? He's, he goes on, and the, the answer is obvious. It's no. Verse 17, even so faith, if it has no works, is what? Is dead being by itself. You can't have faith without faith changing you. You can't, have faith, you can't be touched by God without your heart changing, and now I want to do what's right, and I want to do what's good. 
And then lastly, and maybe most important eternally, good works prepare us for the judgment seat of Christ. You know, we, we see it here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. So every day, everything I say, everything I do, I want it to be pleasing to my God. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus died on the cross and forgave me of my sins so that I wouldn't have to be judged. This is not a judgment of salvation or damnation. This is now a judgment of works. If you make it to the judgment seat of Christ, you're eternally secure. You are saved. You made it to heaven. The judgment seat of Christ is a judgment for believers, and it's a judgment of your works to reward you of your eternal rewards, your eternal judgment for the things that you've done. Watch what he says here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all meaning all the Christians, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. This isn't a fear of, oh no, you know, am I going to lose my salvation? Am I going to be cast into hell? It's not that type of a fear. It's just an awesome thing to be in before the throne of God. It's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing when all of your motives and thoughts, I, you know, I mean, we work so hard trying to hide who we are from each other and from ourselves. It's a fearful thing knowing you're going to stand before God and nothing's hidden. The Bible says we'll be as naked before Him, completely exposed and vulnerable, and every thought, every motive will be revealed. That's getting a little scary, isn't it? Especially when it's before a holy God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 describes this judgment seat of Christ for the believer. He says here in verse 13, each man's work will become evident, meaning it will be obvious. It's going to be really, really clear who and what you are. For the day will show it, the judgment, when, whenever the Bible speaks of fire or the day or the light, in this context, it's talking about the judgment. The judgment will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Was that said in pride? Was that said in humility? Was that done in love? Or was that done out of jealousy? It's testing the quality. What was the reason? What was the motive? What was the thought? And if any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. That's good news, man. That's something to look forward to. And I just, just to encourage you tonight, I bet you guys have a bunch of rewards in heaven you don't even know about. Because there's a lot of things that you've done by the Spirit of God that you either didn't realize what was happening at the time or you've forgotten about it. But let me tell you, you guys got a whole bunch of rewards waiting for you in heaven. Because God is not a God that just nitpicks over the bad. He's looking for everything he can to reward you with on that day. If any man's work is burned up, okay, so these are kind of, you know, maybe they looked spiritual or religious, maybe on the outside they looked favorable, but there's something rotten in the core of this action or word or decision. If any man's work is burned up by the judgment, he will suffer loss, and then this is the key, but he himself will be what? Saved. So this is a judgment of the believer. It's not a judgment of eternal salvation or damnation. It's a judgment of eternal rewards. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. There's just a real distinction that has to be made in our hearts, and I tried to list a few here. What does this all mean? Number one, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved, what? For good works. So we are saved 
by the free gift of God's love and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and there's nothing we will ever do to earn or deserve it. Okay? That's the good news. What's well, all good news? On the balance of that, we are expected to do good works. We are expected to bear fruit. And if we stop bearing fruit, what happens to the branch that stops bearing fruit in John chapter 15? Good works, good fruit is what we were saved to do. And so if we're not doing what we were saved to do, something got messed up in the process. Number two, we are not saved by good works, but we cannot be saved without good works. Because faith without works is dead. This is sobering, I, you know. And it's, it just shows you the balance of biblical truth. Freedom from good works is no freedom at all. It's bondage to sin. If you're not free enough in the Spirit of God to do good works, it's because you are in chains to your own lust and sin. And then number four, never forget this. Good works are performed by Christ in us as we abide in Him. It's, it's not by our own efforts or abilities. It's got to be... We have to become very sensitive to our own heart and sensitive to the Spirit, and we have to be able to discern, am I just trying to make this happen? Am I trying to manufacture some religiosity? Is this, or is this truly the life of Christ in me living through me? Because it's got to be done by Christ in us. It can't be done by our own efforts or abilities. Why don't we just read through this in closing? It's, it's long, but it's worth reading by Chuck Swindoll. There is no wage relationship with God. Meaning, you do this, and God pays you a reward for what you earned or deserved. Spiritually speaking, you and I haven't earned anything but death. Like it or not, we are absolutely bankrupt without eternal hope Without spiritual merit, we have nothing in ourselves that gives us favor in the eyes of our holy and righteous Heavenly Father. So there's nothing we can earn that would cause Him to raise His eyebrows and say, now maybe you deserve eternal life with me. You did such a good job. No way. In fact, the individual whose track record is morally pure has no better chance at earning God's favor than the individual who has made a wreck and waste of his life and is currently living in unrestrained disobedience. That's quite a statement there. Everyone who hopes to be eternally justified must come to God the same way on the basis of grace. It is a gift. And that gift comes to us absolutely free. And I really like this last phrase, this last sentence. Any other view of salvation is heresy, plain and simple. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. and We thank you for a love and a salvation that we can never earn and we will never deserve. Yet you give it so freely. And it's ours by faith, by simple faith. We say, I believe and I receive in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that as we come to you by faith through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I pray that the reality, the reassurance of that faith and conviction would just wash over every heart here tonight. That we would be reassured of your love and that being justified means we are forgiven, we are accepted, and we are favored by God. You rejoice over us. You come looking for us saying, where art thou? You would not let our sin stand in your way. You did whatever it took to remove that obstacle because you wanted to be with us. And Father, we receive that freely, without merit, without works. And now that we are born again and we've received your salvation, you've caused that regeneration of our souls of our spirits to be for one purpose and one aim, to bring glory to You. And sin does not bring glory to You, but good works do. And it's Christ in us that's living, 
We can't do it or manufacture it on our own, but Christ in us can live through us unto good works that bring glory to You. Father, we just ask that You'd make that a reality more and more in our life. And I pray for Your peace, for Your protection and blessing to go with each person here tonight. And we thank You in Jesus' name. Amen.